If you're involved with nonprofits, you know there are certain rules that must be followed. And it goes without saying that people have a lot of fear and respect when it comes to the IRS. But is that all they should be thinking about? What about the states? Is there any concern there? Put it like this. Who should you be more worried about, the IRS or your state? Stick around and find out. The answer may surprise you. Hi, I'm Greg McRae, founder and CEO of Foundation Group, and welcome back to our 501c3 University channel, where we strive to make nonprofit compliance understandable. Mention the letters IRS and watch the visceral reaction on people's faces. It's a programmed Pavlovian response that is almost universal for any American of working age. We've all become programmed to react that way. But there is more to nonprofit compliance than simply being concerned with staying in the good graces of Uncle Sam. There are also state and sometimes local rules that you must know and abide by. In this video, I'm going to talk about compliance enforcement for nonprofits, first starting at the federal level where we all instinctively gravitate, and follow that by a look at state concerns. Let's start with the IRS. Everybody has a story about the IRS. If it doesn't involve that individual personally, they know a guy who got hammered for doing something wrong on his taxes. The reality for nonprofits is this. Federal law is surprisingly complicated when it comes to rules governing tax-exempt nonprofits. There's just a lot to keep up with, and it isn't remotely straightforward. There's a reason our firm has grown every year over its 27-year history. As for the IRS, it's their job to enforce federal law, and there's no avoiding the IRS if someone is starting and operating a nonprofit. IRS compliance falls into two primary experiences for nonprofit leaders. One, 501c3 tax exemption recognition, and two, ongoing reporting and oversight. Obtaining recognition from the IRS as a 501c3 is usually the first meaningful encounter nonprofits are going to have with the IRS. Now, this already assumes you're incorporated at the state level. I'll talk about that more in a minute. The IRS has very strict standards regarding how a nonprofit can qualify to be a 501c3. The IRS requires the organization's purpose and programs to be exclusively charitable, and they have expectations that the state incorporation documents specifically are going to limit the nonprofit's activities and assets to permanently charitable purposes. They even require the nonprofit to document in advance that if the nonprofit ever dissolves, all assets be distributed to another charity. Form 1023 is the IRS application you have to file to get 501c3 status. Now, the standard version of the application is a 26 page document that asks question after question about the nonprofit's proposed structure, governance, purpose, and programs, plus lots of probing questions to ensure that the organization's real mission is for charity, not someone's personal gain. A detailed narrative description of the proposed activities must be submitted along with a three-year proposed budget. If this all sounds like a business plan, well, it really is. If you satisfy the IRS that your new nonprofit qualifies, they will issue you a letter of determination that your organization is now a 501c3. If you don't satisfy them, you'll ultimately receive a letter of adverse determination telling you that you are not a 501c3. I'll give you a hint, it's the first letter that you want. There's also a short version of that application for very small startups. It requires a lot less detail up front, but you're still submitting it under penalty of perjury that your nonprofit does qualify and will abide by all the regulations. The IRS is going to audit an undisclosed number of these short form applications just to make sure that people are doing things the right way. Candidly, they do a lousy job of follow up on that, but at least they're doing something. Once your nonprofit has 501c3 status, it's the annual Form 990 filing that becomes the nexus of most of your IRS compliance concerns going forward. We've got several videos we've done already about Form 990, and we'll link those in the description below. It's best to think of Form 990 as an annual tax return for nonprofits. Now, the version you file each year depends upon what type of 501c3 you are, your annual gross revenue, and or your total value of assets. If you're filing Form 990EZ or higher, expect to provide the IRS with full financial activity as well as answers to lots of yes, no, explain type questions. Form 990 is the primary way the IRS monitors compliance by nonprofits. The IRS's system analyzes all Form 990 filings looking for red flags. Unexpected or inconsistent answers to one or more questions on Form 990 may give the IRS concern that there's problems. 
In fact, Form 990 triggers are the most likely cause of getting audited by the IRS. We've got a whole video on that topic that we're going to link below. Nonprofits can also be scrutinized by the IRS based on state actions, and we'll discuss that more in a minute. Media reports and even publicly submitted concerns by outside individuals. Everything about the IRS sounds scary, doesn't it? I mean, they have the authority to revoke your nonprofit's tax exempt status if you don't stay current on your Form 990 filings. They can also do that if they believe that your nonprofit no longer is exclusively acting in a charitable manner. Well, IRS compliance is to be taken very seriously. But what if I told you that your nonprofit is far more likely to get sideways with your state? than it is with the IRS. Would that surprise you? It's true, so let's take a look at state issues. A nonprofit's first encounter with the state is likely when it gets incorporated as a nonprofit, non-commercial business entity. Generally speaking, states don't ask for much information at this stage. As long as you appropriately fill out their boilerplate incorporation application, it's unusual to be denied approval as a nonprofit corporation. Incorporating is the easy part. Most states will piggyback off the IRS 501c3 status, meaning that if your nonprofit has a 501c3 letter of determination, your state will automatically recognize that as valid for state corporate tax purposes also. But that's not true in all states. California and Texas, in particular, both have tax exemption recognition requirements of their own, as well as annual reporting requirements similar to Form 990. Other states have a patchwork of rules unto themselves. Registering for charitable solicitations is the next biggest area for state compliance enforcement. Again, we've covered this topic extensively and we'll link those videos in the description. 40 or so states require charities to register with the state's Division of Charities in order to legally raise financial support from donors or program participants. Many people get confused as to what constitutes a solicitation, thinking it means holding a fundraiser or conducting a direct mail campaign. While it certainly includes those things, the vast majority of states consider virtually any form of revenue generation by a nonprofit to be the result of a regulated form of solicitation. The key point is this, if your nonprofit is generating revenue in a state that requires registration, you probably need to do that sooner rather than later. Let's talk about state enforcement. There are two areas of state enforcement that are most likely to be encountered by a nonprofit. One is the corporate annual report, and the second is charitable solicitations that we just talked about. Almost every state requires nonprofit corporations to file a corporate report annually. A handful of states have biannual or even longer cycles. It's not that the annual report is particularly difficult to complete, it's not. It's typically updating the state on who the officers and directors are and if the name, address, or registered agent has changed. It's not that the annual report's difficulty or lack thereof is the problem. It's what happens if you don't file it. The state will administratively dissolve your nonprofit, meaning it no longer exists as a corporation. Now, this is doubly bad because your 501c3 status is contingent upon being associated with an active corporation. If you get administratively dissolved, getting it fixed is usually pretty straightforward, but the longer you go, the harder and more expensive it gets. The second area of state enforcement is charitable solicitations. Failure to register or failure to renew your registration each year can result in some very expensive penalties and even result in having your nonprofit prohibited from conducting activities until that issue is resolved. Here's where it gets real. Multiply that situation by the number of states your nonprofit is required to be registered with and you can see very quickly how this can get out of hand. Pro tip of the day, do not go it alone on any of this stuff. Get the professional help you need. Call us. This is what we do for nonprofits like yours. Hear me when I say this, state enforcement is a bigger issue than the IRS. Now that statement surprises a lot of people, but it really shouldn't. The state governmental agencies that regulate charities have a much closer proximity to you than the IRS does. They're often better staffed. They are far more likely to be aware of issues concerning your nonprofit. They are also much more responsive to consumer complaints. All it takes is for a potential donor to report a soliciting charity that isn't properly registered in their state. We've dealt with this a lot with clients who found themselves in that very situation prior to engaging with us. State and federal compliance are both really big deals. Neither is to be scoffed at or underappreciated. Starting and operating a successful nonprofit requires you to start in a compliant manner and stay that way by keeping yourself educated about the rules and getting the help you need to make sure you're doing it right all along the way. Thanks for watching, now go serve your community. Hey, do me a favor and don't navigate away just yet. We would really appreciate it if you would click the like button as it really helps get our content recommended to more people. 
Subscribe if you haven't already, because we have great content coming your way on a regular basis. Finally, you can click the little bell icon to be notified of new content when we post it. To learn more about Foundation Group, you can always visit us on the web at www.501c3.org. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.